Yeah, welcome to the communion Sunday. I'm super excited, and I believe that the presence of the Lord is all in this place. Uh, uh, sweet presence. I think the worship team did a fantastic job in leading us into an amazing time of worship. Well, last week, uh, uh, last week I was uh, uh, to uh, Anandapur actually to do a one-day retreat, and we had an amazing time of 250 young people. Uh, uh, we had a one-day retreat, and God. Uh, ministered and poured out his spirit and we had almost like half of the young people were filled in the holy spirit and started speaking in tongues god is doing great things among the young people and also uh, on saturday nights i request all the young people make sure that you register for sfj and we believe that god is doing great things among the young people uh, of our nation amen amen okay well in a corporate world generally in a corporate world sit across the table bring it to the table it often is used to describe a certain skill or expertise that individual can offer to a company or a project. Sometimes to solve a problem or ideas, they say, let's discuss over the table. I'm sure some people might have used these words and some people might have heard these words. Uh, now, com coming to the table, okay, a lot can happen over a coffee table, right? I mean, it's a coffee day's... Uh, uh, statement and it says a lot can over a coffee and I just added table into that now discussing ideas sharing your thoughts sharing your certain views and agreements negotiation uh, proposals and list goes on and a lot of discussion happens over table now coming to us coming to a table is also a sign of mutual agreement to discuss between two parties now this morning I want to talk about the Lord's table what he offers to us and what we can offer to him. That's my title of message. A lot can happen over this table. Aren't you glad that you are here to be part of that table? Yes. So my text is uh, from uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 to 32. In the later part of the message, uh, probably during the communion time, we'll read that scripture. But I'm sure that we might have come, we have read Every month we read this scripture, it, I'm sure it should be hard. by now, it is by heart to you guys. Now, before I get into my word, I just want to uh, uh, share about my first experience about the communion. I'm telling you, it was a little bit, uh, uh, way back in Millennium Gardens, I went along with my friends uh, to, to the service, and that was happened to be a communion service. So, not knowing much, without knowing much, no, not knowing much about Christ, and I took the element as it passed on, I took and I participated in the communion. And later what happened, after the service, one of my friends, who actually got me, he started saying, hey, did you take the communion? How can you take without knowing it? And um, you know what is gonna happen? I think you're gonna, I mean, he just scared me with a lot of things. And, he, and what he told is, let's go to the pastor and you confess it. And I, I, he literally took me to the pastor's service and pastor's service responded, as usual, you know that. It's okay, it doesn't ha nothing will happen, but he spoke about a little bit about communion to me. So that was my first experience. So I will never forget my uh, experience with uh, communion. Now, now, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 17 to 34, is an important part of the New Testament because it ideal deals with the celebration of Lord's Supper and also referred to the Lord's table or communion. That celebration along with baptism are two significant ordinances within Christianity. The reason of the church attaches so much significance to them is that they were both instituted and commanded by our Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, I feel strongly about the Christian's obedience to those two practices that I think a Christian should question his own commitment if he does not observe them. Sometimes we struggle exactly to know what is God's will is on certain issue. But these ordinances are very clearly com commanded as a vital part, of, vital part of Christian experiences and they should not be taken lightly or certainly should not be igno ignored. Now going back to the history of the Lord's table. Now uh, uh, we have, uh, I'm just going to give you a little bit of drive between the, the, Lord's, uh, uh, the Passover and the Lord's, Lord's Supper. Now, on the night before his death, our, our Lord Jesus Christ gathered his disciples in the upper room to eat a Passover meal. Now, every year, it's a Jewish custom 
They meet together to celebrate a Passover, which was a special meal designed by God to commemorate the deliverance of Israel from the Egypt. After Israel has, after Israel has uh, been in bondage in Egypt for over 400 years, God would deliver them from Egypt, bring them to a land of Canaan, which was to be their own land, having been promised of God to their forefathers. He brought upon Egypt a series of plagues designed to free the nation from Pharaoh's clutches. It was only after the last plague, the death of firstborn throughout the entire land of Egypt, the Pharaoh finally agreed to let the Israelites leave. The children of Israel protected themselves from the angel of death who took the lives of the firstborn by taking the blood of a slain lamb and applying on the doorpost of their house. Then they were eat, then they were eat to eat the roasted lamb along with some unleavened bread and bitter herbs as a Passover meal. Whenever an Israelite participated in the annual Passover fest, he would remember that God delivered his nation out of bondage in Egypt. The Passover celebrated today still remembers the great historic deliverance, but tragically misses the great deliverance that is foreshadowed by the cross of Christ. In continuation of the Passover meal to the Lord's table, Jesus took this ancient fest and transformed it into a meal with a new meaning when he instructed his disciples to drink the cup and eat the bread in the remembrance of his death on their behalf. Therefore, Calvary has superseded the exodus from Egypt as the greatest redemptive event in the history. Now, Christians, Christians don't recall the blood on the doorposts and the lintels, but the blood shed on the cross. The Lord's Supper is a memorial service that Christ himself instituted. He became the ultimate fulfillment of deliverance from sin, death, when he died on the cross and shed his blood. The Lord's Supper became the normal celebration of an early church. Upon hearing Peter's message on the day of Pentecost, say, says many people in Jerusalem were baptized, almost like 3,000 people were added. Now these 3,000 people continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in breaking, in breaking bread and praying every day. That means they used to do break bread every day as they meet together in the book of Acts. It was just amazing. This reminds me of the COVID times. And I'm sure that we, we did in our family. We, we broke the bread, we prayed, and we had a great time together as a family. Uh, now, this morning, I'm gonna talk about the Lord's table. Trade the old with the new covenant. It is more an invitation, and it's a commandment. Here are five things. I'm gonna talk about five things to remember when you come to the Lord's table. And I'm sure that some people have been prepared to come to receive the Lord's uh, uh, table today, and some people might have not. But I want to talk about each time you participate, each time you come to the Lord's table, you need to remember five things which I'm going to share uh, this morning. Now, the, uh, now, Paul is writing to Corinthians. Now, Corinthians was a church where there were a lot of discrimination was happening. They discriminated between the poor and rich. Uh, people would be very... Uh, there were a lot of conflicts that were happening, class differences, and there were uh, there were a lot of real life issues were happening in Book of Corinthians, and that's when Paul instructs, and he gives the instruction how you need to observe the Lord's table. Now this leads me to my first point. Remember the number one. I'm going to talk about five P, and I'm going to ask anyone in the crowd to to tell about five Ps, okay? It's just so make sure that you are very attentive to my five Ps, okay? It's very simple, just five Ps. Number one, remember to prepare for the table. What is the first word? P, preparation. Preparation is a key for success. Not only in our personal life, it is always key for success. Now here, now this is what it says. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 18 says, in the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you, and to some extent, I believe it. Now, Paul had heard more than once there were differences of opinion among the Corinthians when they assembled. Now, Paul heard, and as I said that, Paul heard so many things, and he says, there's so much of divisions among you. Now, you need to understand one thing. Coming to the table is more on a relation. It's a relationship. It's a relationship with you and Lord, and that's why you can't have a meal with a stranger. Did anyone did till now? 
Did you? Did you try? It's more of a relationship that you have a meal, that you, have, you come across to the table and you sit towards the table. And that's what Paul is mentioning about. When you have a Lord Supper, he says there is so much of division among you. Now, division can be in your family members as well. Division in the church as well. Division among your siblings as well. And Lord is telling there's so much of division. Remember to prepare yourself. When you come to the Lord's table, he says, get away from all these differences. Instead of fellowshipping, fellowshipping in spirit of unity, they argued. They already split the church on theological grounds over which leader to follow. That's what we read in Corinthians. Now we learn a social line of separation that had been drawn between the rich and poor. And that's why Paul said, I beseech you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, that there be no division among you, that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. Now, Paul is, is actually very strong on this part. He's saying, hey, you guys have so much of division. You better come together. We want you to live in unity. It is the same God that brings us together. It is the same spirit that brings us together. Some of the areas that we can be divided within our families, it could be money, it could be greed, it could be favoritism shown by parents, a lack of affection, Love and care and respect. I want you to pin part of the fa- favoritism by shown by parents. And I, I come across, especially I just want to address this, because a lot of young people come to Youth Alive, they always say that my parents support my elder brother, especially girls. Talk about this. I don't know why this favoritism is. God has made us equal. It's both of them, let it be a boy or a girl or two siblings, they are a gift from God. Most of the times, people are just barely making a living, no time for family, let alone a brother or a sister living a thousand miles away. I think it's, there's a beautiful thing when we come as a family together in unity. There's a power that happens, that the power that flows when we are together in unity. Church, this morning I want to urge you, if there is any differences in your family, if there's any differences within your community, I want you to just come together. Probably if, if you have to take that one step to bring that unity, do that. Because there is a power. And Paul urges the Corinthians to be united together. The second thing that we see here in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 27, uh, 30, talks about examine. Let us examine himself. And he talks about examining ourselves. Confessing our sins. Now, how many people uh, have prepared yourself to receive the Lord, I mean, to, to partake in the Lord's table? It's so important because we come, sometimes we come so casually, we take it just for granted. Oh, there's an element there, we just pick it up and keep it sometimes. Sometimes we don't even know where we keep it because it's a lack of. Because we just take it, take it so casually and granted. But here, Paul talks about examine yourself. Before I say what it means, let me say what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean you have to be perfect to take communion. Paul does not say only perfect Christians are allowed to take communion. If only perfect Christians took communion, nobody would have been eligible to take that, right? If only perfect Christians are eligible to take communion, I'm sure, I don't think so, anybody in this place would be eligible to take a communion. The warning is not for perfection, but to avoid the mistakes of the Corinthians were making. It doesn't mean that you have to examine yourself toward the point of unhealthy introspection. For some of you, the moment before taking communion, you consider all the shortcomings of the week. Sometimes we just, oh, before I take communion, oh, I didn't do my quiet time, I didn't do this, I didn't do that. I, you confess everything at that moment, right? When Paul says, don't take the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner, he's speaking all the issues going on on the Corinthian self-examination of one soul before partaking the Lord's, Lord's Supper involves determining whether or not he's a Christian. Basically, talks about whether your relationship with God is right, whether you are a Christian or not. That's what he's talking about. Do not take it unworthy manner. Basically, he's talking about your lifestyle. Basically, he's talking about your relationship with God, your relationship with Jesus Christ. We are to consider whether we are trusting in Christ alone for salvation and we are to repent 
for the unbelief that remains in our heart. Sometimes we need to repent. That's what he says, that you need to repent for the sins. Sometimes there is so much of unbelief in, in, in us as well. He says, you need to repent for those things. Examine yourself, considering your heart before God. In those churches, if you're living in a secret, ongoing, unrepentant sin, you shouldn't, you shouldn't take communion. Basically, it talks about you're not recognizing Jesus as a Lord and Savior, and you're living a, a, a secret life, an unrepentant sin, and that's when Paul is saying, don't take communion. Is your heart right with God? Although you're not perfect, does your private life matches your public confession? Is there love in your heart for church? Basically, he's talking about, is your heart right with God? He's your personal life with Jesus is matching with public life. Because Corinthians communion service had been corrupted with selflessness, drunkenness, and discrimination against poor. That's why Paul instructs so much of instruction to the Corinthians. He says, don't do this, don't do this. Paul went on to, no, oh, Paul went on to teach the Corinthians how they could avoid taking communion unworthily by examining their motives and actions and making sure they lined up with the significance of the Lord's Supper. They were to perform the self-examination in preparation of taking and drinking and avoid bringing God's discipline on themselves. Now if you read, it's very, very scary about God's discipline. And I mean, one, one, one sentence I just want to read, it says, you will, I mean, some, some people are asleep, it says, you know? It's a very scary thing if you're not prepared. Basically, what he's talking about, your motives about God, your intentions about God, your walk with God, basically he's talking about those things. Now Paul says that Lord's Supper should, should be a time of celebration of the church in which Christians focus honoring Jesus, exhibiting unity, and proclaiming the gospel, Christ's salvation. The focus ought to be others, not on oneself in this manner, Believers, avoid taking communion unworthily. If you are unworthy, if you are if you are not sure of your salvation, if you are not trusting God, if you are not prepared, it says that if if you are living a self-centered life, a selfish life, and that's when Paul says, avoid taking communion. Now this takes me to the second point. It says, what is the first one I said? Yeah, good. I think. 60% of people told that, prepare. The second point is participate. Remember to participate in the table. And I'm sure all of us this morning have come because we know every month, first Sunday is a communion service that we, you and I need to participate. Now, this is what the word of God says in Jude chapter, verse 12, it says, these are, uh, these are the spots in your love feast while they feast with you without fear, serving only themselves. Observing the Lord's uh, Lord's Supper carries personal significance because Jesus calls us to remember to remember that he gave his body for you. It carries personal responsibility for us to participate with reverence, humility, sincerity, understanding the proclaiming Christ's great act of love. When you have reverence towards God, you honor him, you express gratitude to him, and obey his commandments. Your prayer life, your reading the word, and fasting, and payment of tithes and offering, you will do to the T, because you revere God, you fear God. And that's what Paul is asking, he's challenging, Corinthians saying that you need to revere God, you need to honor God in, in the actions, not only reading by reading the word, but in your actions, by reading the word, by praising, by, by worshiping, by doing fasting, by getting involved in the spiritual activities of the church and of the, of the Bible, and that's why you honor God, and you revere God. And, but you see these guys, especially the Corinthians, they did everything without fear, without fear. And that's why Paul is so strict with them. He say, hey, you, if you do this, God is gonna punish you. And also if you read in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 20 to 20, 20, 20, to 20 this is what it says. No, but the sacrifice of pagans are offered to demons, not to God. I do not want you to, part, I do not want you to be a participant with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and cup of the demons too. You cannot have, part, you cannot have a part in both Lord's table and the table of 
demons. That means Paul is saying, hey guys, you are living actually double standard life. There is no holiness in, it, in you at all. And most of the times, now some of, some of the examples of double standard life is setting two sets of rules, hypocrisy, being unequal, showing discrimination, being unfair, double standard life in your relationship. And God hates it. I don't have to ask you, but you know your, for yourself. You know your walk with God. You know how your standards are. Because you might fool 1,000 people, you might fool 10,000 people. You cannot fool yourself and you cannot fool God. And God, your Paul is saying to Corinthians, hey guys, you are living a double standard life. There is no holiness in you. And he says, we need to have a reverence when you come into the house of God. We need to have a reverence when we partake in the Lord's table because it is sacred and it is divine. It's so important for us to do that. That leads me to the third point. Remember to praise over the table. Matthew chapter 26, verse 28 says, this is my blood of covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. We should remember why Jesus suffered and died. He did what he did for us. He did it for our sins. Now, you need to understand one thing. Now, Matthew records Jesus' words in the way he gives disciples the cup. This is my blood of the covenant, which poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Now, you need to understand that you, when we come to the table, we need to have praise, an attitude of praise, because he has done he has died for us. He shed every drop of blood for you and for me to make us worthy to partake in, his, in the Lord's table, right? And also, he has forgiven our sins. He died so that you and I can live. We need to be grateful to this God. When you come to the table, it reminds us of, of the cross. It reminds of every drop of blood. It reminds of, of the, the, the things that he has gone. I think it's just a remembrance. We need to thank God. We need to praise God because Jesus did not, uh, I mean, Jesus did not go unwillingly to the cross. Jesus did not die as a martyr's death. He went to the cross for a purpose. He went there to die in our place so that our sins might be forgiven. We all know what the scripture talks about. The Bible talks about that everyone have come short against the glory of God. That means you and I have come, come short against the glory of God. That's what we read in Romans chapter three, verse 23. And Romans six twenty-three talks about wages of sin is death and the gift of God is it in our life. He died so that you and I can live. There is a solemn side of communion, but communion should also be a time of celebration. We were separated from God because of sin, but Christ died, us, died for us so that we might be forgiven, and we praise God for that, right? God, Jesus, made a way for us. He made a way for us to reconcile with the Father because there was the one thing that can always build a blessing, build a barrier between you and God is always a sin. Uh, one thing can stop the blessing of God in your life is it's only sin because sin becomes a barrier. And Jesus took all of your sin on the cross. He broke that barrier and he became a bridge for us to, to the Father. God made, no. First Corinthians chapter 11, 25 says, the old covenant required a sacrifice of animals by the law, but God made a new covenant with us in Jesus. Jesus was the final sacrifice for our sins. So whoever puts faith in him is forgiven. It is not by our works. Sometimes we think, if I do good works, God will forgive me, I can have a ticket to heaven. But I'm telling you, good works are filthy rags before God. Your good works will not save you. Your faith in Christ alone can save you. Sometimes we see people all across, right, in our, in our community, they do all good work, thinking that salvation, they can achieve salvation. But I want to tell you, the Bible tells us, no, faith in Christ alone gives you an assurance of salvation. Not your good works. So thank God for the Father for his great love in sending Christ. Thank God for his son for laying down his life for us. Thank God for the Holy Spirit 
coming into our life and washing us, making us clean. And thank God for the forgiveness of sins. Matthew chapter 26, verse 29 says, I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of this wine from now on until that day when I drink it with, drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. By saying this, Jesus, it establishes two facts. Firstly, that, that this is going to be the last supper because he would be crucified in some time. Secondly, though this was going to be the last time he was going to supper with, the, with them, with the disciples, there's still hope because he's going to rise again and go to the Father and so we can join him in heaven. And that's why we can praise him because he promised to celebrate the Passover meal with us once again at his Father's kingdom, which means he will take us all, he will take all of us there someday. His desire, see, in this verse he says that his desire that he wants to have a, a, a meal with you he wants everyone, he wants everyone to partake in that meal. He, because someday, that's what he's saying, someday I'm gonna come, I'm gonna take every one of us and we're gonna do the, uh, uh, the, the, the wedding supper in heaven. And that's why we, we see that. We just need to thank God for that. Now, we, we just praise God because God is, Jesus is eagerly waiting for you. He, wa- he doesn't want you to miss an etern- eternity. He doesn't want you to get astray. He wants to have a communion with you. He wants to have a relationship with you so that he, he wants to take you where he is and to have the last meal with him. What are the four points I said? What was the first point I said? Only 30% people said. The second one. The third one. The fourth one. I'm gonna talk now, okay, yeah. Now the fourth point talks about remember, it says, this is what the the scripture says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 26 says, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. That means a proclamation. Remember to proclaim about the table. The Lord's Supper is our fellowship meal with God in the present. And it's a beautiful time of coming together as a body of Christ until the time when Christ returns. It is a proclamation that Jesus died. Jesus died for our sins, for all who trust him. Built into the proclamation is the promise that Christ will one day return. In that way, Lord's Supper involves both looking, looking back to the cross, looking forward to Christ's return to the earth. Each time we observe the ordinance of the communion, we are not only remembering what he has done on the cross, we are, we are showing it, it as well to watch, I mean, for all the people who even participate, communion is a beautiful picture of what happened at the cross, what it means, and how it impacts our lives as a believer. Luke chapter 22 verse 18 says, for I say unto you, I will not drink of, of the fruit of the wine, until the kingdom of God shall come. Basically, proclaiming the second coming of Jesus. I mean, we need to proclaim. Whenever you come to the table, we need to proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. That means you're gonna talk about it. You're gonna talk about how Jesus died for all of us, for, for all our sins he died on the cross. And only in that, we're gonna proclaim that Jesus is gonna come back again and take us, all of us, there. Which brings to the, the third meal with God, the wedding supper of the Lamb. The Passover is a meal of the past. The Lord's Supper is a meal of the present. The wedding supper is a meal. The wedding supper of the Lamb is a meal of the future future. The Bible says it is a wedding supper of the Lamb that we celebrate. Remember, Passover meal was a meal of the Lamb. The Lord's Supper commemorates Jesus, our Passover Lamb, who was sacrificed for us. The Lord's Supper is not only a memorial service of Jesus' death on a cross, it also points, to us, points us towards his return. And doing so, it looks forward to when a greater event, a greater meal, this wedding supper of the Lamb. We read about wedding supper of the Lamb in Revelations 19. This take me to my last, last point. The last P is the promise. Remember the promise of the table. John chapter six, verse 56 says, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood will remain in me. The promise is he helps us to remain in him. Whenever you partake the Lord's table, 
But now you're partaking in the element. Jesus remains in you and you remain in him. What, what can be a greater joy than that? God himself remains in you and has a fellowship with you. Now this moment, people receive Christ, they become identified with him. Jesus also added, identified himself with a the believer. There is now a mutual indwelling between Jesus and those who believe in him. This is an intimate relationship. Is it amazing? When you partake in the Lord's table, he remains in you and you remain in him. And that's how you'll be able to bear much fruit. The Bible says that. When you abide, now the word abide means remain, giving the idea of, a, of abiding effect or belief in Christ. Coming to Christ is something more than what is fleeting. The relationship to Christ is a permanent one. When you abide in him, Christ becomes your refuge. He becomes your stronghold, a place of defense, a proper dwelling for them where they dwell safely, peacefully, comfortably, pleasantly, for which dwelling place they will never be turned out. Amazing, right? I mean, that's a promise of God. When you dwell in me, when I dwell in you, I'm going to secure you from everything. You can have a peaceful life. I mean, you can, you, 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 you can, be, you can be rest assured of your safety. He becomes your refuge. He becomes your comforter. He becomes your strength. He becomes everything. He will guard you from everything when you remain in him, when he remains in you. John chapter 6, verse 58 says, Jesus says again, whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. The spiritual understanding of Jesus as the bread of life. He claims to be the bread of life. I mean, he is the bread of life. That's what we read in the Bible. That means whenever you eat his bread, you will live forever. Because when, when you eat this bread, basically it means that when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you live for eternity. Spiritual understanding of Jesus as the bread of life. In a way, it's a promise of resurrection and a life to everyone who believes. And those who believe in, in the spiritual bread came down from him and will live forever. That's the beautiful thing about Jesus. Whenever you partake in the Lord's table, you proclaim, right? You proclaim. You proclaim that he's going to, he, I mean, he died for your cross. He died for your sins. You proclaim that he's going to come back again. When the promise of the table is that he's going to remain in you, right? He's going to remain in you. And also, he's going to help you to live forever. That's the promise of God. What are the five P's I spoke about? Because I'm going to come to the conclusion. Number one, preparation. Number two, participate. Number three, praise. Praise God when you come to the table. Number four, proclaim the good news. Proclaim the second coming. Number five, amazing promise that is going to remain in you and you will live forever because when you trust God, when you live, when you accept him as a Lord and Savior. The con in conclusion, God's greatest invitation to come. Who comes to me, I will never drive away. That's what we read in John chapter 35, verse 37. It says that, you know, not only that, but marvel in God's great, great, gracious invitation to come. God did not have to invite you to this table, but he did. Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry. He who believes in me will never be thirsty. All that Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never, ever drive away. That means Jesus is willing to take everyone. If you're thinking that you are the worst sinner of this world, no problem. He's willing to accept you. He's giving you open invitation this morning. Probably you have never accepted Christ as a personal savior. He's saying, just come to me. I will not drive you out. I want to become your shield. I want to become your refuge. I want to, be, I want to remain in you. Come. The Bible says, he's a loving God. He accepts you the way you are. You don't have to portray yourself. You don't have to do anything to, to, to please him. He says, just come, just as you are. He's willing to accept you. He's willing to take you. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ this morning, it is because Jesus invited you to come. God the Father has graciously drawn, drawn you to himself 
and sat you down at the table with his son. Not because of anything righteous that you have done, but simply by his own goodness and grace. Salvation is not by your works. It is gracious gift of God, which is received by faith in Jesus Christ. And so the Lord's table is a place of celebration, a place to celebrate God's forgiveness and grace. Church this morning, we come month after month to be part of the Lord's table. I know sometimes we take it granted, sometimes we take it lightly, we don't rever, we just do it just because of doing it, probably you might have never meant, but it's a serious thing because it's a sacred thing that we do. And I want you to just close your eyes, probably you can just stand for a minute. I want you to just close your eyes. Everyone in this place, just close your eyes. Probably you might have never done this before or before you partaking in the Lord's table. And I want you to think about it. Have you come prepared to be part of the Lord's table? Are you ready to participate in the Lord's table? Are you willing to proclaim about the table? And God promises that he will be with you. I want you to make the small confession this whole call, small confession with Jesus and say, God, probably you, you want, if you want to confess those sins, unrepented sins which is in your heart, you can do that this morning. And probably you have never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. This morning, He's willing. He's willing to take you. He's willing to accept you. All that you need to do is just believe in Him. Say, Jesus, I come before you. Forgive me from all my sins. All that you need to do that small prayer. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood applied. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus.